Hello everyone. I see people are uh, slowly joining our group. Um, welcome to the opening of our uh, Inspire seminar series. And this is my great, great pleasure to have such uh, amazing speakers with us today. Uh, Tony Shapiro, Pin, and uh, Fatou Geifler. I will introduce them and the seminar in a second. Uh, first of all, I wanted to tell you two words about the INSPIRE project. Um, uh, so the seminar series is under the uh, project that is called Inspirational Creative Practice, the work of artists after war and violent conflict. Uh, that is a research project uh, that studies the role of artists and creative practice in and after uh, violent conflicts. The project is hosted by the Peace Research Institute in Oslo and connected to the PRIO Center on Culture and Violent uh, Conflict. And uh, those of you who know the project, um, uh, we've been uh, doing this project since uh, January uh, 2020. And some of you also participated in the launch of our platform, so you can find out more information about the project and the work that we are doing, the collaborative work with different artists in Myanmar, Sudan, and uh, artists, uh, exiled artists working in uh, European countries <clears throat> on our website, inspire.gallery. Uh, where you're going to also be able to learn more about the specific research projects as well as our different activities. And uh, today uh, I have the pleasure uh, to uh, to open the uh, seminar series. This is our first seminar. Every month we're going to be meeting with different artists, researchers, um, activists, also, uh, um, I would say cultural practitioners uh, who are working on the issues that are at the core uh, of our uh, inquiry in the research project. And uh, today I have, uh, we're going to listen to the seminar um, about mother, singer, survivor of Liberia's civil war and refugee as community builder. And we're going to have the pleasure to hear from Fatou Geifler. Uh, who is a former principal performer uh, with Liberia's National Cultural Troupe and a renowned uh, recording artist. Um, now a resident of the United States, she's a funding member of the Liberian Women's Chorus for Change. She has been recognized with a Leeway uh, Foundation Transformation Award for her work, for her art, her artistic work and social justice work. A prestigious PU uh, from the Liberian Entertainment uh, Awards and celebrated as a cultural icon by the Liberian National Cultural Ambassadors of the United States. And uh, Fatou is going to be in conversation with um, uh, Tony Shapiro Pim, who is with us today live uh, from the United States. So thank you, Tony, so much for joining us at such an early hour. Um, uh, Tony is a professor of creativity, the arts and social transformation and the assistant director of the program in peace building and the arts at Brandeis University in the US. Um, the movie that we're going to see during the seminar today uh, that Fatou and Tony worked on together is called Because of the War. Uh, the movie won the 2018 American Folklore Society Ellie Congress Miranda Prize for superior work on women's traditional vernacular or local culture and or feminist theory and folklore. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to, uh, um, to, to, to Tony. But before I do this, I would like to say that um, we're going to have first a short clip, um, greetings from Fatu. Fatu cannot be with us in person. Uh, she's working at this time, uh, so, uh, so she couldn't join us uh, directly. Uh, but we're going to have some words from her. Then uh, Tony is going to uh, comment um, uh, with introductory remarks. Then we're going to watch a film and that will last about 30 minutes. Then Tony will come back with some closing remarks and we then open uh, for the um, session of questions and answers that will be moderated by Sarah Christopherson, who is with us here. She is also the moderator, coordinator and the co-designer of the of our uh, Inspire, Inspire uh, virtual platform. Um, I would like to remind you that the event is being recorded 
and that whenever you have questions, you can type them in the uh, in the chat box and then Sarah will come back to them in the um, questions and answer part. And oh, I haven't introduced myself. So my name is Kasia Grabska and um, uh, I am the leader of the Inspire project and I'm based at Prio. Uh, welcome everyone. And now I hand over to the uh, amazing people that are with us today. So first we go to Fatu. I am very sorry I cannot be with you people today, but I am about to give you one of our folk songs from Liberia. And all of our folk songs from Liberia are call and answer songs. So I'm going to try my best to call and answer myself. So um, here we go. The song is called Bingin Bingin. It's the bear, the bear is ringing. Bingin 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 Kume Ape Ma. Bingin 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 Kume Ape. Zoya Bano Nanyo. Zoya Bano. Zoya Bano Mama Babi Yewa. Ah, Yama Yewa. Inga Inga. Inga Inga. Yama Yewa. Yeye Bangma Yaya Faye Yaya Buru Kaya Zoba Me. Ama yewa mama babe yewa nyema yewa yewa o na yewa e e e zo ya bono na yo benge 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 kume ya pema benge 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 kume ya pema zo ya bono na yo zo ya bono zo ya bono mama babe yewa nyema yewa. Inga 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 ya mai wa ye ye bang bang ya ye fa ye ye bulu kayo zo bang bang ama ye wa mama babi ye wa ah ye mai ye wa ye wa o na ye wa e e zo ya bono na yo thank you this song is saying the zo is coming let us ring the bell and inform the people that he's on his way. She's on her way because this is from the Sane Society. All girls society song. Thank you. Nana, you have gotten the taste of Liberian, one of Liberian folk songs uh, from the Sane Society. We are here, of course, today to talk about a movie because of the war. And unfortunately, I cannot be with you guys today. Even Tony cannot be there physically but we can give you a little bit of background of our movie. So at this time, I'm very proud to present to you, Tony. Tony, you are welcome. Uh, shall I start my comments now? Okay, thanks. Uh, so I want to offer my sincere thank you to Kasia, Sarah, and Indigo. I was especially drawn to this seminar series because of its focus on the ethics of engagement across differences, on collaborative endeavors between artists and others, and on what might constitute relationships of integrity. When Fatu Gayflor, Liberian superstar singer and recording artist, and since the 1990s, anti-violence and community building activist as well. When she and I started our professional relationship, she had been in the United States city of Philadelphia for more than a decade, singing at Liberian events, putting out new CDs when possible, and working to support her family in group homes for people with emotional and intellectual disabilities. And I was working in a small arts and social justice nonprofit organization, which I'll describe more in the recording you're about to see. So we met, she a brilliant artist and mother, a black African immigrant who sings in 16 languages, who composes original songs that respond to current concerns and uh, that imagine better futures. And she also plays the shakere, a beaded gourd instrument. She has a wealth of knowledge gained in part through experience in the Sunday Society, which she mentioned in that opening clip. 
The song she sang to open our event is one she learned in the Sunday Society, which is a rite of passage for young girls in various communities of West Africa, in which they are educated in the ways of the world through traditional song and dance. In that particular song, the arrival of the ritual specialist, the Zo, is announced through the ringing of the bell. So that's a bit about Fatu. And I'm a cultural anthropologist, a cultural producer and writer, long engaged in applied work in communities at the nexus of the arts and social justice efforts in several countries. As a native born United States citizen who speaks English as a first language, as a white person with a PhD, I walk in the world, let's say in the world of the city of Philadelphia where we were both living when we first worked together. Um, I, walk, I walk in the world differently than she does. People respond to Fatu and to me differently. And we also experience that world of Philadelphia differently. As with many who are displaced from their homelands and cultures and extended families, Fatu has experienced the epistemic violence of not being heard or understood or valued in this new land for who she is, for what knowledge she carries and her ways of knowing, what skills she shares and what beauty she bestows. Today, we're speaking with you about a movie project that we undertook in part as a way of reaching across differences to counter that violence. A movie in which four women tell their own stories, though as director, uh, any misrepresentations are my fault, and through which particular kinds of audiences are engaged in conversation, relationship building, and pledges of action. Our hope was that younger Liberians would recognize the wisdom and leadership of Fatu and her colleagues and be encouraged to look within their own communities for creativity in facing difficult community issues, that they would see artist heroes in their midst, and that non-Liberians would, as one audience member put it, fall in love with an immigrant through the film and learn to listen and hear others in deep, compassionate ways. I'm not a scholar of Liberia. I guess I did a kind of on-the-job fieldwork um, through working with Liberian communities for uh, more than a decade. Um, but Fatu and I and the other Liberian artists relied heavily on their own expertise and on the input of ethnomusicologist Dr. Ruth Stone. She's a leading scholar of Liberian music. So before turning back to the recorded session, which Fatu and I made ahead of time, because she can't be here today, um, which you'll see momentarily, I just want to point out that Fatu Gayflor, Toke Toma, Zay Titi, and Marie Nyenabo, the other women in the Liberian Women's Chorus and in the movie, each have a unique approach to the anti-violence work they did in Liberia, the Ivory Coast, and elsewhere in West Africa. Never in isolation, it unfolded alongside other conflict transformation efforts. The movie shows just a glimpse of what they've contributed to their homeland and to wherever else they've been. I'll be back with some closing remarks after the recording has played. Thanks. Thanks so much. That was a, a beautiful song and a nice way to open our event today. We work together on a movie and I want to give you some background information about how the movie even came to be. Um, Fatu and I, along with others, collaborated on this movie project while I was working at a nonprofit arts and social justice organization called the Philadelphia Folklore Project. The Philadelphia Folklore Project works to nurture and sustain cultural and artistic practices rooted in the histories and traditions of people in Philadelphia, especially in ways that counter injustice and foster flourishing. Philadelphia, which lies between New York City and Washington DC in the United States, is home to more than 10,000 Liberians. Some estimates put the population, if you add in surrounding neighborhoods, at double that number. Most Liberians arrived there as refugees during or following back-to-back -back civil wars, the second one ending in 2003. Others came as immigrants. And there is now, of course, as well, a generation of Liberian Americans born in the United States. So the Folklore Project had a decades-long relationship with members of local Liberian communities. And in, I think it was 2012 or so, we brought in 
Dudley Cock of Roadside Theatre as a consultant on a story circles project with a handful of Liberian artists, a storyteller and singers and dancers. And Dudley had developed a certain story circle methodology along with others. So the Liberian artists, a couple of whom had approached the folklore project with a request to figure out how best to address some pressing issues among Liberian refugees and immigrants, they got training in audio recording techniques and interviewing techniques and set out to interview folks to find out what the word was on the street, what's happening in their communities that needs critical attention. Then the storytellers, singers, and dancers would bring what they had heard back to collective meetings in our gallery and share um, as part of a story circle and sometimes through a retelling, through song or movement, they shared what they were finding. And eventually they crafted some threads of stories they had been gathering into a dance drama conceived of and created in traditional styles and then performed this new piece back to members of their own communities. The response was immediate and visceral from the audience, mainly women stood up as if they were giving testimony. They started telling stories of abuse and abandonment and of overcoming it. And this went on and on. So ultimately the Liberian artists at the heart of the endeavor met to assess their work and decided they wanted to form a first ever Liberian women's chorus for change to figure out ways to combat intimate partner violence in Liberians homes. The storyteller and one of the dancers stepped to the side and additional singers instead were brought in. They decided to use the skills and expertise and strengths they had as singing and dancing superstars. Um, they are called by Liberians the Adels and Beyonces of Liberia, meaning people of all generations know and love their music. So um, they wanted to use their position um, to start conversations about dignity and safety and laws. My job was to help get money to pay them to do this and to connect them with information and networks that they could then pass on within their communities. We partnered with Women Against Abuse, a local organization um, that does education and advocacy. Um, the Liberian Women's Chorus was on local radio programs. They performed in pop-up and stage concerts, especially where Liberians gather. They did programs after services in churches that had large Liberian congregations. And all of this was undertaken with an aim to counter the isolation that so many immigrant women, and in this case, Liberian women were experiencing because of language barriers, um, lack of access to information about their rights, because of fears of speaking out given an uncertain immigration status and so on. And I wonder Fatu, if you would share with us what some of your favorite moments have been um, in terms of being part of the Liberian Women's Chorus for Change. Oh, thanks for asking that question. I remember we went to Rucker University in Norwalk. Everybody enjoyed the show. We left after a couple of maybe weeks or into a month. A girl we met again at another show that came to us and said, oh, when I was in Rucker, I saw you guys perform. And I was very carried away with the show. And because of that, I opened my own online program to talk to the youth. She's, imagine she's very young. She's in her late 20s. And she was very moved by what we were doing. She decided to go online, open her own online program that would cater to the youth. Because like what she said to us, what you're doing today is not just for your now, it's for us. We are the coming feature. We need to learn from these and we need to know when we are with someone, if that person is not the rightful person, what decision can we make to be able to live our life better? Thanks, Fatu. I have one more question before we uh, move into the movie itself. Um, when you were in, um, I mean, when you were in Liberia, you mentioned the war and then you ended up um, being a refugee in neighboring countries in West Africa. Could you 
tell people who are unfamiliar about some of the things you did as a singer and with your music, with your art, um, to address the crisis at that moment, especially with other women? Yes, when we left, uh, when we fled from Liberia, we went to uh, the neighboring country. I settled in a couple of countries. <laughs> I first of all landed in Africa, in the border uh, town called Danane. I lived in Danane for a couple of years. Um, was a little bit depressed from the beginning, but when I saw uh, artists that I knew from Baiku, we all decided to work together and go from one village to another village to sing and bring people, Liberians that were living there so depressed and had no knowledge of when we will return home, when the war will be over. But our present there every time gave them some comfort. So we will go to the places, we will put program and we will talk about it with a flyer or the people come to see or perform. And when they come, you will definitely see women that are lost, oh my God, they lost their senses, they lost their dignity, they lost everything that they got because they lost their children in the war or because they lost their, their husbands in the war and the cross. You will meet with them after the show because they knew of before the war, they will come, oh, Fatu Gefla, I didn't know you were here. Thank God you live in the war, but you really did well. You performed that song you did. We love that song. I lost my own. So we will sit there, talk, and cry. So those things were helping us to cope with our own problems. Because I have my own problem. I have my own problems. I couldn't see my family. My son got missing in the war. That's a big problem I have. But meeting with the people, using my career to go to the people and meeting with them after the show talking, it really helped me a lot. It didn't carry my problem away, like I said in the movie, but it helps a lot. It helped me to live day by day to, to do what I could do. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, one of my responsibilities um, when the Liberian Women's Chorus uh, for Change was formed was to document their work. So I'd followed them everywhere with a video camera. We recorded rehearsals, um, we recorded planning and assessment meetings, yeah, and events in the community. At one point, I thought I'd put together, you know, maybe some short video profiles of each of the four women in the chorus. And then then realized that there was enough material and there were enough stories for 20 hours each. So we reoriented aspects of our work and hired videographers to add some solid filming technique to the footage I had taken already over those few years. And we embarked on not only making a documentary film about the individual women in the chorus, but also planning intentional ways for the film screenings to have a constructive impact. Um, so we're going to start by showing you the trailer for the movie. Because they started getting afraid from one another. Because the war, there were other people who hit other people, other people hit other try. We were all in the dormitory and out of a setting we heard gun shooting and we didn't know where to go. This is a responsibility that I'm about to take. It's not just thinking, but I'm going to pass messages over to people who are very bitter. What can I do to make them to, to tell sweet? So that we stay together as a family, so that our children will live in a happy community. 
So the movie is presented in four chapters uh, in which each of the women in the chorus tells parts of her own story. The main focus is on their lives, artistry, and anti-violence work in Liberia, and for some in refugee camps in neighboring West African countries. Um, only a bit at the end is about the chorus. And we're going to show you a, a few excerpts from the film um, before we talk about uh, its um, the screenings and impact since then. Um, in the first excerpt is actually two excerpts joined together from the chapter about Toke Toma. She was a recording star and dancer who in fact um, worked with Lema Bowie who won the Nobel Peace Prize um, for her anti-violence work in Liberia. Um, they worked together during the war. And this begins with a tiny segment showing how Toke was um, selected from her village to join the National Cultural Troop. And Fatu too was part of that National Cultural Troop. And then a tiny bit uh, of an excerpt from her talking about wartime. I remember I used to watch the girls dancing because I was not too good in dancing before. The late third boy was on his way to Butu. That day, I don't know where that talent came from and it just came upon me i got on stage i was like i can try i found myself dancing very active <laughs> the program he sent for my dad and he said I learned the little girls that then today the bright one is your daughter can you bring her over so he asked me do you want to leave your parents at this time my father said yeah 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 I said yes my dad was happy because among all the chiefs and his daughter was chosen by the president so he was so so much happy <laughs> this is how I go into it. Kenya was a very beautiful place. The village was built close to the to the ocean. So when you approach it, you will start hearing the sound of the sea rolling. Very the very day I landed in Kenya. I got there in the night and in the morning they took us off for an audition. And from that day I started dancing, I didn't stop. <laughs> When the war came to Liberia, from that day I felt that this is a responsibility that I'm about to take. It's not just thinking, but I'm going to pass messages over to people who are very bitter. What can I do to make them to, to taste sweet? The responsibility became mine to change a very angry man to a peaceful person. Most of the songs at that time were not just for entertainment, it was all about peace. This is how I came up with this song, We Want Peace, No More War. It was the very first song that I ever wrote 
We want peace or oh, no more war. We want peace or oh, no more war. We want peace, no more war. We want peace or oh, no more. Liberians are one people living in one nation. We want peace. We want peace, no more war. We want peace or oh, no more. United we will stand. Divided we will fall. We want peace. We want peace. No more war. I was surprised when the women of Liberia, led by Limo Buddy, started singing that song. There they will be sitting down, whether it raining, they are there singing that song over and over. And some day they sing it with happiness, and some day they sing it and cry. And then they started putting their own words. I mean, I was really enjoying them because that one song you could say anything inside, but it should just be peace. It should just surround peace. And now the last excerpt we'll share is from Fatu's section of the movie. Fatu is the most famous of the four women in the chorus. Um, I just want to say, share a little story. When um, Fatu and I were both interviewed on a radio program, this radio program, so after about an hour of conversation with Fatu, they opened the phone lines up. And the first caller was someone who had been listening to the radio in her car. She said she pulled over, stopped, was in tears and had to call in. She herself is Liberian, didn't know where Fatu was, and um, spoke about how important Fatu's music has always been to her. And then the second caller also uh, originally from Liberia and living in the United States, was a man who said that as he was rushing to pack whatever he could to leave because the war had reached his home to escape, he intentionally played one of Fatu's songs um, to wrap himself in um, the beauty of Liberia before he left his country. So in this excerpt of the movie, which we'll now share, uh, we're joining about halfway through her story. She speaks about Mohammed, who is her child, who has been missing since um, 1990. Fatu had gone to the Ivory Coast to record an album, expecting to be gone for a couple of weeks. And Mohammed, her two-year-old, was with family members at home in Monrovia, Liberia's capital. They lost him in the chaos as the war unexpectedly reached the capital while Fatu was away. And in this excerpt, she also mentions Baby T, her daughter born in the United States and introduced earlier in the movie. Here's the excerpt. <laughs> So each time I perform for them, I was feeling real good. Real good. Now, hey, Fatu, you're not alone. You got people who struggle, seeing like you, and you're going to make it. Liberian men are punching their women over and over in front of us, but they are financial, emotional. They are all things that we are trying to tell our sisters and brothers. Speak out. <laughs> this stress is too much in this country, but we still make it. How can we make it?
have to stand for ourselves. All we want is someone to stand so that we stay together as a family, so that our children will live in a happy home. That's all. Oh, I used to like be so sad and I would listen to your music and you would take me out of my depression. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I didn't need therapy, I needed you. Thank you. I'm like, now you have read a red bite to the old songs. Yeah, the old song is the one that I like. I am a lady, Stop. That's the song he played on. I am a lady. Yes. Oh, you're the baby Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Some people will come in and say, oh, you know, since the Liberian war has been so long, why are you still grieving? <laughs> Everybody moon different. And I think the thing that has helped me a lot with Mohammed's story is whenever I will perform, I meet people of the same problem. It really helped me a lot not to forget, but to be able to withstand, to even speak about him. Many people think when you fought war, that means you don't feel death. But no, it's not a key. One life is very important. Baby T let her play on my phone. She opened the phone and she said, Mommy, I'm seeing plenty of pictures from somebody. Then I said, bring it, let me see. And I opened it. I started to cry. Then she said, Mommy, why? Why are you crying? And she didn't know why I was crying. She started to cry too. So I told her, I said, but you don't, I haven't told you what I was crying. She said, but it made me feel bad when you crying. So we both sat in my room and cried. Then I told her, this way supposed to be one of your big brothers. So yeah, we did that. Maybe one day I will meet somebody who will come tap my shoulder and say, I'm your son and I'm here. I said, maybe. So Fatu, um, would you speak to us about why making the movie was important to you? The movie has brought a big change to my life. And some of the changes are, one, I will already stress on it because that's the number one. I, I didn't have the opportunity or the guts to stay and speak to people. Come in here, <laughs> you got to introduce the song, you got to tell the people what the song is. All of them have given me the opportunity to be who I am today, speaking to people and doing what I'm doing. So those are the things that the movie really brought to us. 
those things are very important. Very, very important. I said the number one thing is I will live forever with this movie because people will see me and they will remember what I have done for my country, Liberia and other countries. So we've done um, many screenings explicitly for Liberian audiences and we've done some that are open to anyone. Mm -hmm. And um, just to say that some of the intention behind sharing the movie with uh, people who are not Liberian is especially in the United States, is to combat anti-immigrant sentiment and policy. That everyone has a story and um, potentially um, the talent, skills, the cultural knowledge to affect positive change. Um, other uh, audiences have been very, very tiny and really sort of curated for specific reasons. For example, we did a screening, like a dinner and a movie night for police officers in mm. the Philadelphia neighborhoods where many Liberians live. Mm. And um, we invited them both to a screening. So they saw the movie in the little gallery of the Folklore Project. The women in the movie were there, um, police officers, um, and a, a facilitator who is both an artist and a previous police officer. Mm -hmm. And also we catered a dinner by a local Liberian chef. So we were going to watch the movie and have a kind of formal facilitated conversation and then sit down to dinner. But after the movie, the police officers, first they wanted to sit in silence for a while. And then they had their own things to say, no matter what the questions were that we had prepared for a formal discussion. I mean, it was uh, quite quite moving and overwhelming. And I wonder, Fatu, if you would speak about that evening, that exchange with them. The police officers that watched the show, someone had commented that they made, I can just relate to it as, oh, wow, we live among these people. We see them every day. These are people we arrest, or these are people we don't even know they exist, but they are in our community. They are refugees, but this is how we, we will look at them today after this movie. Their way of speaking make us to know that they actually look at us different after that movie. After our show, we scream our show, they will stay in contact with some of our friends. That means whatever they saw there, it touched them. It was not just going to a movie, eat park on, drink, and the movie is over, you go home. This one was something that people who the watch were sitting with them in that building. They spoke to us, they held our hand, they touched us, they took pictures. They knew that this was not just a movie to make for people to watch and be happy. This were actual stuff. This were actual story from the actual people that be in this thing. So that was really great for me to see. We asked questions. It was in the heat of people killing black people. It was in the heat of uh, police killing black people. So when they watch our film, some of us, we asked questions. We wanted to know what's going on. And they took their time to tell us. So the police officers got to know who we were and how they will go about dealing with people they so-called call refugees all the time. Refugees are human beings. We are people from different land that struggled from war and came here as a refugees. We live here. But our name or the title of refugee doesn't just stop on being refugee. We give, when I say give, we put into the community too. Thank you, Indigo. Um, I, I just have a, a two short comments um, before we open for some questions. Um, Fatu was just talking about the evening with the police officers, and I want to add that they told us that they recognized their own mothers, sisters, and wives 
in the women in the movie and couldn't imagine how their mothers, sisters, and wives would respond or what choices they would make in the situations that Fatu and her colleagues had been in. It was in recognizing the agency, the choices these women made um, that showed the officers were hearing and seeing them as complex individuals in their full humanity. They were listening across difference. And the other uh, thing I wanted to say is, I, I want to mention about an unanticipated impact of this work in Liberia. Um, when we were just about to finish the movie, I thought, Gee, I've heard Toke Toma, the, the first woman whose excerpt you saw, I've heard her speak all the time about her father, Chief Toma of the town of Butuo. Um, you know, I've heard her speak about him for years and I just happened to Google him. And uh, remarkably enough, something popped up. He had been interviewed in the 1960s by um, the world famous Robert Ferris Thompson, who is a scholar of African art. So I ordered the book and I, I told Toki about it. And the next time the women in the chorus were together for rehearsal, um, I presented the book to her and it had this photograph that you saw in the clip of her father and she fainted because there were no other extant images of him. And he had been the first person assassinated in the civil war when the rebels crossed the border into Liberia. Um, so when she had this book with the words of her father and his cultural knowledge, she and her family members from around the world decided they would have their first ever family reunion. They were in diaspora in many different countries and they would recite his words. Uh, tragically, Toke passed away before that could happen, unexpectedly. And um, I was asked to speak at her funeral. So at her funeral in the United States, I told this story about her father and the book and the, uh, the picture. And after I spoke, the next person to get up to speak at her funeral was someone who came to the United States from Liberia just for this funeral and said, I don't know the woman who just spoke, but I, I want her to know and all of you to know that um, the town uh, where her father lived, where Toke was born and raised, Buto, now since the lo locating of um, those words by Chief Toma has incorporated his cultural knowledge into the public school curriculum there. So young people are educated by Chief Toma about their mask and dance traditions. Anyway, I'll leave it at that. And thank you very much. Tony and Fatu, thank you so much. I, I have to say that it's been extremely moving to see such a rich and, and extremely complex way in which you both engaged. And, and, and I think you gave us so much uh, through the film and through your exchange with Fatu. So thank you for sharing this with us. I now turn to uh, to to Sarah uh, and for everybody a reminder that you need to type the questions uh, in the chat. So Sarah. Thank you. Yes, so we have about uh, 10 minutes for any questions and um, you can also raise your hand. So there's a little symbol where you can raise a hand, a yellow hand. So either type your questions in the comments or raise your hand and we'll make it possible for you to unmute yourself so you can ask the question yourself if you prefer that. So we have a hand raised. Cindy, uh, just hold on a moment and you, Indigo will make sure that you can unmute yourself. So when you see it's possible to unmute yourself, please do. And you're also very welcome to turn on your camera. Uh, and of course, introduce yourselves if you want. Hi, Hi. <laughs> my name is Cindy Rost and um, I just wanted to use the opportunity of, um, of people thinking of questions to uh, to say thanks a lot. This was extremely moving and I'm not really sure whether there's going to be a question or not. But um, I think one of the things that I find fascinating with both of you talking is talking about all these ripple effects 
Um, so very often when we talk about transformation, especially in relation to um, peace and, and conflict, we're talking about this kind of macro um, aspects of it. And then a lot of what you're doing is totally invisible and it's not recognized and it's not seen. Um, and what you do is you're constantly pointing to all these really important ripple effects. So now you say, OK, there's the curriculum and these kids are being taught this and that's huge. Um, so I guess because this is something I'm very interested in as well, because I do feel that in order to really see uh, these transformations happening, it, it's community work. It's it's work that of the kind that you're doing. Uh, do you have any kind of ideas or suggestions on how to, I don't know whether we want to capture it more or how to argue more for the fact that these are really important aspects of how societies work towards transformation in such an extremely difficult uh, phase. You're nodding, so you're at least <laughs> getting, it's understanding where I'm getting. Thank you so much. Actually, I want to Thank you. It's not just for the question and the comment, but you're making me think. Um, I'm engaged separately in some work with UNESCO. They have a project they call the Art Lab for uh, Human Rights and Dialogue, something along those lines. And um, I believe it was started in 2020. And um, what we've been doing and they've been doing, I'm, I'm part of a team, is um, gathering uh, stories about and examples of initiatives around the globe, um, arts-based initiatives with communities in some kind of precarity, um, experiencing some kind of oppression, and it often has to do with um, different kinds of violence, exile, etc. not exclusively, but often. And um, part of the aim of the publication of these examples is to make a case just like what you're saying you know to amplify um what might go on behind the scenes uh, to show people that it is worthwhile to invest energy effort time money whatever it takes um, into initiatives and individuals and groups and communities who are engaged in this kind of work that is both valued internally and then has those ripple effects and i hadn't thought about it in that way before the ripple effects but now i'm going to incorporate that uh, into our uh interpretation and illumination of all of these examples so thank you for that um i i do want to say that um I, and i hope this i hope this fits in with the kind of thing you were um pointing to um, that paying attention to the ways in which communication works in different communities is vital too. So for example, it might have been easy for me in my position to say, oh, we'll hang up flyers or we'll publish here or we'll do something on a certain radio program and maybe absolutely, I mean, maybe some, but maybe no Liberians would ever know what was going on um, because I'm maybe out of touch with how communication works uh, in particular communities. So it really is important to figure out where the avenues are, where people are listening to each other, where they are looking for connection. And it was through that, um, through the, the women, the four women in the movie, their own networks, that word got out, at least among Liberians. And then they got word back, for example, that young women in a certain county, uh, Liberia is divided into counties, often by ethnic group, but not always. So in a certain county, the women of the ethnic group that Toke Toma and Zaytiti are part of, got in touch with them through Facebook because they had seen things on YouTube and um, asked them to mentor them. Asked, these young women in Liberia said, we want to make a chorus too not just because we love to sing, we want to learn how to be community leaders and we see that you're doing that. So another ripple effect. Thank you, Tony. 
Um, I think we have time for one more question. Yes, Kasia. Uh, I see that there are some comments coming, coming in. in. Oh. I, I don't know exact question, so Sarah. Oh, then I'll actually also just address uh, the comments um, uh, quickly before I give the word to you, Kasia. So Prum, um, he's writing, wow, thank you so much for this presentation, to Ming Tony. Um, I was in tears at several moments, especially as there were so many echoes to the experience of the Khmer and Khmer American communities. Can you talk about how the Liberian Women's Chorus for Change, their stories and their work has been shared among other refugee communities and what kind of dialogues and collaborations might have been built in these interactions? And then I'm also going to give you uh, Janine Madeleine's comment. And that is, thank you a lot for this, uh, for presenting this wonderful film and collaboration. It has been mentioned a couple of times that performing is about spreading a message. Do you consider art primarily, sorry, the image is in the way here, primarily as a way of communication, or would you rather prefer another concept to describe the social role of art? Okay, hey, um, I have about a minute, but can I <laughs> say what I can? Um, I'm to say what you can in a minute. <laughs> thanks, Prum, very much. Prum calls me Ming Tony, which means ant in uh, Khmer, in the Cambodian language. Great to have you here. And I love Prum's work. And this is a, a call out for everyone to attend the next session of the seminar series because Prum will be presenting. And he's a brilliant thinker and artist. So your question about um, Cambodians or other refugee communities or displaced communities, we had our intention in this dinner and a um, screening dinner in a movie series to do something just like that. But um, COVID has interrupted those kinds of things. And I, I hope uh, this is a great reminder, Prum, that that should be a priority. But I want to tell you one story. And Fatu has given me permission to share this um, story. We do, um, we had some training in uh, how to be trauma informed in our work, all of us. and. Um, with the women themselves, how uh, the women could take care of themselves when um, emotions rose as they were speaking about um, certain aspects of their lives, when they could, when they wanted to step back. I mean, how to how to take care of themselves and each other through this process. And um, when we screen the movie too, we talk to audiences about um, what is involved. And one time we were at. Um, a university in the United States had spent a week, Fatu and I, teaching in, you know, women in music classes and human rights classes, et cetera, et cetera, peace and conflict studies classes. And at the end of the week, we showed the movie. So there were hundreds of university students in the audience. And um, at the end, the professor who had invited us uh, had us come up onto the stage. And whatever the first question that professor asked of Fatu, she collapsed into my lap like sobbing. And she said, my son, my son. And um, so I asked the professor if she could walk Fatu back to her seat. And I spoke to the students about trauma and about um, uh, how, you know, the best prepared we can be doesn't mean we're always prepared and one never knows because um, these are people's lives that they carry with them everywhere. And um, I said, so we wouldn't have a question and answer session. And nobody left. Nobody left. Maybe 200 students. What they did was they lined up and each one came and hugged Fatu and told her something. And Prum in the audience were three people from Cambodia who happened to be in the neighborhood of that university. And they started to tell her their stories and said, come to our house. We want to feed you. Um, we want to we want to exchange with you. So there's a seed of that. And another person came to her and said, you know, I, my mother is Liberian. And now for the first time, I think I have the vocabulary to talk to her about the war. She would never say anything. And then the last thing I'll say is another a group of students came to her and said, we sing in a Jewish music women's a cappella group. Would you come and teach us? So from all of these different angles, people felt a resonance and that she had something to give them of a value. 
And that, that's just a, a story you reminded me of, Pearl, because of your mention of Cambodians. So thank you. Thank you so much, Tony. I'm uh, Indigo has posted a link to um, uh, to a website where there is you can find more information about uh, your you and Fatu your and Fatu's work. So all of you can find that in the comments. And then also, I just want to read a comment from Tuna Panila Osten, where she says, "Thank you so much for this. I am touched and cannot think of questions because I'm just overwhelmed by your work. Thank you. I might connect later if questions turn up, if that's okay. Uh, thank you also to Prio for organizing. So, and I think. That maybe sums up a little bit the feeling that many of us are sitting with. So I want to say thank you so much, Tony. And also, like you said, um, we're very lucky to have Prum here today and he's actually presenting. He's he's going to be our next speaker and it's that will be happening on the 13th of October, uh, same time, also on Microsoft Teams. So I hope all of you save the dates and join us again in about a month's time. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.